I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly. Flurry of decisions. The nation's highest court delivers several far-reaching rulings, including on the January 6th riot at the Capitol. Sparking debate. A closer look at the first presidential head-to-head -head encounter and what comes next for both candidates. Bible study, a major announcement from the top education official in Oklahoma, and headed home, an interview with a U.S. ambassador to the Holy See who is set to step down next month. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Irenaeus. Our top story tonight, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump both hit the campaign trail today after a night of blasting each other on the debate stage in Atlanta. But it's President Biden who's really taking a beating over his performance last night and whether he should continue running for re-election. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. That's right, Tracy. Fact-checking aside for now, it was really all about the performance last night. President Biden at times appeared, or was, I should say, incoherent and appeared tired. But he was back out on the campaign trail today seeking votes in places like North Carolina. Less than 24 hours after what was by most accounts for him a bad night on the debate stage, President Joe Biden, his wife Jill alongside him, takes to the campaign stage. Now, folks... I don't know what you did last night, but I spent 90, stage, 90 minutes on the stage debating a guy who has the morals of an alley cat. The president in Raleigh, North Carolina, a state he barely lost last time, forging ahead to November with no evidence he is willing to end his campaign. Folks, I don't walk as easy as I used to. I don't speak as smoothly as I used to. I don't deb debate as well as I used to. But I know what I do know. I know how to tell the truth. But even before the debate last night, Biden's age has been a liability with voters. In Atlanta, he seemed to lose his train of thought and had difficulty finishing his arguments. Excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare, after the debate at a Waffle House, the president, who said he has a sore throat, was asked whether he was concerned about his performance. No, I, that, it's hard to, hard to debate a liar. New York Times pointed out he made lied 26 times. Big lies. He didn't tell me. Presidential debates often scored on style and impression over substance. Last night, Trump appearing more confident and composed. And today, the Republican holding a rally in Chesapeake, Virginia. Hello. Virginia, did anybody last night watch a thing called the debate? Virginia, a one-time battleground state, a state Trump's aides believe he can flip in November. For President Joe Biden, North Carolina, not his only stop today. He was also off to New York and New Jersey to raise campaign cash and also attend a Pride Month fundraiser. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, joining us now is Dr. Paul Kengor, professor of political science at Grove City College, editor of The American Spectator, and author of numerous books, including the bestseller, A Pope and a Present. Dr. Kengor, always great to see you. Uh, a lot to talk about here. But first, I want to get your overall thoughts on the debate and also the big takeaways. Well, thanks, Tracy. So first of all, I don't even know how to put it into a few words, right? Um, historic, unforgettable. Uh, and, a, and a huge number of people, yeah, and a, and a huge number of people watched that debate, and I think probably more than any other debate that I that I could think of in re recent history, it was it was immensely entertaining, right, and and also frankly very sad and and kind of pathetic, and I must say that um, I think for the record that Joe Biden lost his reelection bid in that debate last night, and I'll add, add here that. I believe in 2020, in the first presidential debate, I think Donald Trump lost his reelection bid in that first debate because he was overly aggressive. Uh, Trump was even kind of obnoxious, um, it, uh, you know, belligerent. But last night, I mean, Joe Biden just showed, and he showed it to Democrats too, that, that he he's not he's not mentally there. And I, I don't mean that in an insulting, uncharitable way. 
But you can see that in the reactions from Democrats and liberals today. They want somebody else. And by the way, they've wanted somebody else for about a year now. And this really proved to them that I think they have to have somebody else. But the question is, who would that be? I don't think we really know. Yeah, and what would that process even entail? Yeah, it's a good question. And I mean, you would think it would defer to the Veep, right? And that would be Kamala Harris. But she's actually more unpopular than Joe Biden. In fact, the real clear politics average for his for Biden's approval number, he's at, he's at 39%. And he's been at like 39 or 40 for about three months now. And I'll tell you what, Tracy, you get below 40, you're toast. Uh, Donald Trump, I think, was about 44 or 45 at this, at this point in the fourth year of his term. And he didn't win with that. Uh, Bush, uh, George W. Bush and also Barack Obama were both around 48. They won with that. You get at 40 or below 40 and you're done. And that's been, like I said, the last couple months, I don't know what it's going to be next week. And also going into the debate last night, Joe Biden was up, or uh, Donald Trump's up by about 1.5% overall in the composite polls and up by about 2.6% in a five person race. I would expect the 1.5 to go up to maybe three. Uh, now, now, Trump still has a ceiling that he hits, and there's a lot of people, that, especially Democrats, liberals, who are going to vote for Joe Biden no matter what because they can't stand Donald Trump. But, but the whole issue and the whole debate last night was over that 20 percent, right? There's probably 40 percent absolutely committed to Trump, 40 percent absolutely committed to Biden. It's a battle for that other 20 percent. And I would have to think that Biden overwhelmingly lost that 20 percent last night. Paul, I want to ask this question real quick before we run out of time. Uh, what do you think about the format? Uh, many have been comparing it to the JFK and Nixon debate back in 1960. Um, what about the parallels there? What do you think? Yeah, I thought the format was really good. I thought CNN did a great job, uh, Dana Bash and, and Jay Tapper both. And and frankly, and I and, and really, Tracy, I suspected this from the outset when I heard, heard the rules, I thought it would favor Donald Trump. Because Trump could be his own worst enemy in a, in a debate like that, kind of impetuous, rash, lashing out. And he couldn't do that last night because his mic was cut off. So whereas he looked obnoxious in that way in the first debate in 2020, he didn't look that way last night. He might have still looked aggressive at times, but he was cut off. And that helped Trump. Um, you know, that, that made him, I think, look uh, less rash, less impetuous. And um, overall, it helped him uh, for sure. And also, the whole split screen debate, given Joe Biden's uh, mental wherewithal and at times seeming almost catatonic, staring off, staring at the ground, uh, the split screen did not help Joe Biden last night. That debate was a disaster for Joe Biden. Yeah, we're going to leave it right there. Paul, always great to be with you. Always appreciate your insights. God bless. Same to you, Tracy. Thanks. Now, Capitol Hill is abuzz with reaction to last night's debate between President Biden and former President Trump. Republicans call it a, a knockout victory by Donald Trump. Meanwhile, Democrats say Trump doesn't have the integrity to be the chief executive. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the latest. Eric. Good evening, Tracy. Let's begin tonight with the elephant in the room, the cognitive skills of President Joe Biden. Many Republicans jumped on that theme today, saying that if someone can't complete a few sentences without going off track or losing their train of thought, then that person cannot occupy the Oval Office. After the debate last night, um, I think everyone can see the objective fact that we have been discussing here for, for a long, long time, that President Biden is not up to the job. I mean, everyone sees that clearly. Former White House physician Congressman Ronnie Jackson says President Biden's decline is obvious. I mean, I, I've been saying it for three and a half years, you know, uh, cognitive issues uh, uh, getting worse by the day and, you know, uh, really uh, no, no business at all uh, being a president, you know, being the president of the United States. Republicans add it's now a national security issue for the country. We have enemies who want to kill us. This president that you saw last night has to make a decision within 30 seconds whether he's going to uh, strike back should we be struck or fired upon by a nuclear missile. That's a scary position to be in. Democrats spent the day attacking former President Trump's character while touting Biden's accomplishments. And the American people got a chance tonight 
to be reminded about the character of Donald Trump, uh, a man who stood there and lied for 90 minutes straight. And a massive infrastructure bill, negotiating prescription drugs, those were all things that presidents aspired to. President Biden got them done. So what matters more, performance in the debate but, or yeah, performance the president? perception is reality. Putting together perception. sentences and yeah. keeping your train in had, had a bad debate. We move on. True. Republicans tell me the longer this goes, the worse it's going to get and are calling on the first lady to step in. Are you going to let him just go up to and embarrass himself like he did yesterday? Shame on her for allowing this to happen. So, Joe, you saw what happened. The American people saw what happened. The world witnessed it. This isn't funny anymore. There is some question on whether the next debate planned for September will even take place. Some Democrats are urging the president not to do it and instead focus on just campaigning. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN, News Nightly. Now from Capitol Hill to the Supreme Court, where Chief Justice John Roberts announced the last rulings of the term will be issued on Monday. Today, the justices released three decisions. The biggest judgment came in Fisher versus the United States. A six to three conservative major majority ruled that January 6 rioters could not be prosecuted under a rare financial record keeping law that criminalizes destroying evidence and obstructing an official proceeding. For more, let's go to Rick Garnett, professor of law and director of the Notre Dame program on church, state, and society. He also clerked for former Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist. Rick, great to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Um, first off, let's start with a case involving January 6th. Your reaction and what it means for those charged under the provision. Yeah, really quick thing. An interesting thing about this case is that it wasn't 6-3 with the conservatives against the liberals. Justice Amy Barrett dissented in this case, and Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson was in the majority. So there was a kind of cross uh, partisan uh, disagreement here. This is a case about how to interpret a federal obstruction of justice statute. And it was really in the weeds lawyering by the justices, uh, the chief justice on one side for the majority and Justice Barrett on the other. And it was just, like I said, just really good interesting lawyer. I'm going to use the, the case in my criminal law class next semester. In terms of what it means for the folks with January 6th um, uh, convictions, the, the reality is not much. Uh, almost all of the people who were convicted were convicted of multiple charges under multiple statutes. So a whole lot of people are going to have to be resentenced, but it's very unlikely that very many people will either um, have their sentences eliminated entirely or that they'll get those people who have been sentenced to jail time, prison time, that they'll get substantially less time. So it's, it's an interesting technical case, but it's actually not going to make much difference to them. And it probably won't make much difference itself to the, um, the case that uh, Mr. Smith has going against former President Trump. Yeah, and I was going to ask about that because two of the four charges against uh, former President Trump uh, in his January 6th indictment involved this obstruction law. So can we yeah. maybe talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, well, so the wrinkle is this, this particular statute uh, it was enacted after the Enron scandals. And the, the disagreement among the justices was whether it's limited to cases where a person is, is uh, alleged to have interfered with an uh, uh, official proceeding in a particular way, namely by tampering with evidence, with, you know, shredding documents, that kind of stuff, because that had happened after the Enron um, problems. A lot, you know, obviously, these people in January 6th who were storming the Capitol, for the most part, they weren't doing anything like that. So the, the court said, you know, you stretched the statute too far to use it uh, against those people. In President Trump's case, it's at least alleged, we'll see what happens in terms of proving, but it's at least alleged that um, he was involved in some efforts perhaps to uh, mess with some documentation, right? Some of the official forms that you would need to do the electoral count. So even on the court's new interpretation, in theory, uh, uh, President Trump's alleged conduct might come under that. Yeah, we have about a minute left or so, but I also want to get to this one, another big one, a 6-3 to three ruling in the Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo. Um, in this case, the court greatly curtailed federal agencies' powers. Tell us more about that and what this ruling now means for small businesses. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting and important case. Basically, it has to do with um, when, when we have a regulation that an agency has created and there's a, some kind of legal challenge about the meaning of that regulation, um, should the court defer to the agency or should the court exercise its own independent judgment? And obviously, if, a, if the rule is courts should defer, that gives the agencies a lot more power. And that's what this Chevron rule 
had had decreed that generally speaking, courts should defer to the agencies when they're um, enacting regulations uh, on matters that are within their purview. And what the court said today, and again, this is very important, is that um, the structure of administrative law in the United States requires judges to make legal determinations on their own and not to sort of outsource those uh, that decision making to the administrative agencies. So you asked about small business. I mean, small businesses, like so many other parts of our lives, are, are pervasively regulated. And what this means is just that folks can be sure that questions about the meaning of federal law are going to be decided by judges rather than by uh, administrators. All right. We're going to leave it there. Great to be with you. Thanks so much for your insights. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, the Iowa Supreme Court removes a lower court ruling that put a temporary block on the state's strict pro-life law. The measure bans abortion after around six weeks. It passed during a special session last July. Well, the top education official in Oklahoma orders schools to teach the Bible in grades 5 through 12. Superintendent Ryan Walters says the Bible is a reference point in major parts of American history. The Bible is a necessary historical document to teach our kids about the history of this country, to have a complete understanding of Western civilization, to have an understanding of the basis of our legal system, and it's frankly, we're talking about the Bible, one of the most foundational documents used for the Constitution and the birth of our country. We also find In yesterday's announcement, history. Walters says that he expects immediate and strict compliance. Some civil rights groups say the directive is unconstitutional and an abuse of power. And in Texas, the state Supreme Court upholds a ban on so-called gender-affirming care for minors. The law prevents minors from accessing hormone therapies, puberty blockers, and transition surgeries. Parents filed a lawsuit saying that it violated their rights to seek medical care for transgender children. Uh, the former Uvalde Schools police chief has been indicted over his role in the slow response to the deadly 2022 shooting at an elementary school. Pete Arandondo was indicted on 10 counts of felony child endangerment or abandonment for his inaction. Another former school officer was also charged. They are the first law enforcement officials to face criminal charges since the tragedy that killed 21 people, including children. Footage shows some officers just waiting outside of a classroom as the gunman opened fire inside. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including election in Iran. Voters head to the polls with a choice between hardline candidates and a little-known option seeking improved relations with the West. A snap presidential election is underway in Iran roughly a month after the former president died in a plane crash. The contest is among three candidates. One vows to seek friendly relations with the West. The others are hardliners. The voting comes amid massive tension in the Middle East over Israel's conflicts with Hamas and Hezbollah, both groups which are armed by Iran. Despite the voting, the supreme leader still has final say on matters of state. And for more, we turn to Dr. Farid Rezai, Senior Research Fellow at the Philos Project and an expert on Iran. Farid, great to be with you again. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the top candidates here and who seems to be favored in this race. Well, there are four candidates running for presidency in Iran. Saeed Jalili, who is Khamenei's representative in the Nas Supreme National Security Council. Mohammad Bakr Qalibak, who is an IRGC commander and the current speaker of the Iranian Majlis. Then we have Masoud Pezeshkian, who presents himself as a reformist. And then the last one is, Ma is Mustafa Pur Mohammadi, uh, a former minister of interior who played a, a key role in the mass execution of political prisoners in 1988. And I think none of these candidates that you just mentioned favor a better relationship with the West. Even if they, they are inclined to improve these relationships, they would have a limited influence because the strategic direction of the country and, and the foreign policy of Iran are basically determined by the Supreme Leader, by the Ayatollah Khamenei, not by the president. President basically, president in the, in the Islamic Republic basically holds a, a symbolic position and, and does not have the authority to alter the country's relationship with the West. 
Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, and as we did as well, you mean the Supreme Leader has to sign off or basically approve the winner. So I guess the question there is, I mean, will this actually be a fair and free election? Um, well, we shouldn't actually expect a meaningful change because elections in Iran have historically not been free or fair. The totalitarian regime under the Ayatollah Khamenei exerts a tight control uh, over the election process through two key institutions. The Guardian Council, which vets all the prospective candidates to ensure they are loyal to the regime, and then the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, which plays a significant role in manipulating election outcomes. So I think it's highly unlikely that the election will be free or fair. The IRGC and the Guardian Council are expected to continue to uh, their, their practice of manipulating the election outcome to ensure that only candidates loyal to Ayatollah Khamenei and the regime hold power. And what do you think, quickly, what will this, the election results, what do you think it will mean for the people of Iran? Um, well, as I said, it would not be a meaningful change, honestly. The, 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 the strategic decisions in the country, either with regards to domestic policies or foreign policy, are determined by Ayatollah Khamenei, not by the, by the uh, president. There is a famous quote from the former president, Mohammad Khatami, who said, the president, at, as at its best, is the coordinator. The real power and the influence wills in the hand of the supreme leader. The president uh, holds a, a symbolic position, basically. Yeah. Well, Dr. Razai, thank you so much for coming on. So much more we could talk about, but we have to leave it right there. Thank we you. appreciate your time, as always. Thank you very much. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, speaking out. A top advisor to Pope Francis weighs in on artwork from Father Marco Rupnik. Plus, a boatload of people join the National Eucharistic Pilgrimage. We have the details. Welcome back. The head of the Vatican's Commission for the Protection of Minors is joining the calls to remove church artwork done by a former Jesuit priest. Cardinal Sean O'Malley joined some of Father Mark Rupnik's victims in asking that the former Jesuit priest's artwork be removed. Rupnik is accused of sexual misconduct and was removed from the Jesuit order. His artwork is found in some of the most visited churches in the world. While these are the final days in office for the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Joe Donnelly, a former congressman from Indiana. He spent two years at the Vatican. In one of his final interviews on the job, he tells EWTN Vatican correspondent Colin Flynn about his time in Rome and addresses Cardinal Wilton Gregory's criticism of President Biden's cafeteria Catholicism. Ambassador Joe Donnelly, great to see you again. Good to see you too. Thank you very much. This is beautiful. It is. We're here in the garden of your residence. Yes. You're going to miss this. Uh, it's a beautiful place. But you know what? I get a chance to come home to the country I love with all my heart, the United States. What are you going to miss most about Rome? The people. Um, the chance to work with Pope Francis, who's such a kind, humble, um, wonderful person. To work as the representative of the United States to the Vatican has been an amazing privilege and to serve our country and President Biden has been amazing. The recent G7 summit here in Italy, you were there in the room when U.S. President Joe Biden met with the Holy Father Pope Francis. I was. What was it like? What did they discuss? And what's the relationship like between the two of them behind the cameras, the closed doors? They are, they are very close friends. They are great friends. And so um, it was a chance for them to see each other again and you could see them both light up. I know that um, for the president, he considers the, the Holy Father a friend. You know, what's not seen all the time is, is they've had a number of uh, phone calls on, on various issues, you, you know, regarding peace, regarding stability in the world. And so um, they lean on each other, I think. And uh, it, they're great friends, and it was a real privilege to be a part of it. Has it been difficult for you, in a way, to be 
the ambassador for the United States at a time like this because you have a ca another Catholic president in Joe Biden and there is debate and arguing around how Catholic he is in some circles. I know recently on television, the cardinal in Washington, D.C., Wilton Gregory, said on Face the Nation that he was a cafeteria Catholic, the phrase he used. Pick and choose what appeals to him, he said, and leaves the rest, which was surprising to see him say that so publicly on television. What was the reaction from the White House? Well, I can't tell you what the reaction from the White House was. I can tell you, I think, in the Gospel of Matthew, where they said, before you try to pick the plank out of someone else's eye, you ought to worry about the speck in your own eye. And what that means to me is, like, work on your own soul before you try to tell somebody else, well, they didn't do this right or they didn't do that right. Here's what I know. Joe Biden is a man of incredibly deep faith who is on his knees every Sunday, who's saying the rosary on a constant basis. This is a man who is the spearhead of passing a health care bill against a lot of folks who said how religious they were and worked every day to stop the health care. Knowing that viewers will be divided on it, they will look to that and say that's admirable and that's Catholic and the Christian thing to do. But then they will look to the president and say, but his support of abortion and the unborn children and that's where that uh, expression cafeteria Catholic came from the cardinal. He does the best he can every single day. Um, and does everything he can to help families, to help make sure that um, our country is strong, to help make sure that he lives out in his mind his faith. Um, and, and it's amazing how some people can criticize one side when on the other side they'll walk by somebody who's hungry in the streets. So, you know, everybody has their own definition of what faith is. When you return to the U.S., what will be one of the first things you'll do? I think I'll go and get a hamburger and french fries <laughs> and a milkshake. <laughs> you get a good old Americana. I'll probably pass on pasta for at least a week. Ambassador, it was great talking Thank to you. Thank it's you so much. It's my privilege. Thanks. <laughs> That sounds good to me, too. Well, finally tonight, not all the National Eucharistic Pilgrimage is being done by foot. Recently, the Eucharist was transported as part of a motorcade. Bishop Mark Brennan raised the monstrance, holding the most blessed sacrament during a trip down the Ohio River. The faithful waited eagerly on both sides of the river to receive the Eucharistic blessing. The procession ended with an all-night vigil in West Virginia. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook X and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.